close to the border of the Segmentum Tempestus, in the Eulus Sector, there is the radiated death world by the name of Krieg. Any Orger Array scanning would tell you that this planet is well and truly dead. Its stratosphere is filled with dust, and the temperature is far too low to sustain human life. The air is severely poisonous and filled with ionizing radioactive particles, these being leftovers from an old war that ended in a catastrophic atomic deluge that still renders the land severely hostile to all forms of life. No plants are able to grow in the radioactive ash that covers the surface of Krieg, and the oceans, or rather what's left of them, are but completely contaminated with toxic chemicals. Despite these bleak and poisonous conditions on the surface, it surprisingly remains the active homeworld of rather infamous regiment of the Astra Militarum, known as the Death Corps of Krieg. This regiment is not only renowned for its ability as experts of siege warfare, they are second to none in their dedication and unconditional loyalty to the Emperor of Mankind, a reputation they have costly earned over the centuries. There are no civilians on Krieg, only soldiers. Their military forces are trained in the hostile conditions of their very home planet. With little else to do on this barren hellscape, the people of Krieg are raised from birth to serve in the army. They are trained not only to survive in these very hostile conditions, but to actively thrive in them, to be able to withstand the worst possible conditions that a battlefield can throw at them. And thus, the Death Corps forces are among the most battle-hardened and resilient guardsmen that can be found within the wider Imperium. But this wasn't always the case for this war-torn world. Indeed, before the apocalyptic destruction of their planet, Krieg was once a thriving and rich hive world populated by countless billions. Far from the barren wasteland it has been reduced to now, it was known for being a prosperous center of trade and manufacturing within the sector. As far as the Imperium goes, Krieg was in fact as pleasant and hospitable as could realistically be expected of a hive world in the 41st millennium. A major reason for Krieg's well-being, apart from its useful location in the sector, was the stability and mutual cooperation of its ruling class, altogether known as the Council of Autocrats. This council was a collection of nobles and elites with uncontested dictatorial rule over the various hive cities of Krieg. This prosperity, however, wasn't necessarily the result of visionary leadership, no. In fact, most members of this council were predominantly concerned with securing their own fortunes. Their obsession with sustaining their decadent lifestyles of excessive luxury and status would always come first. Krieg's contribution to the Imperium was of lesser concern. But of course, where such simple vanity and greed is concerned, people are fairly predictable. This stability and mercantile attitude has been the main driving force towards the long-term, reliable and profitable trade that has made Krieg so exorbitantly wealthy. Such positions of leadership are, of course, extremely coveted, fueled by their personal ambitions. Many figureheads on this council had ruthlessly elbowed themselves through the Imperium's bureaucratic ladder to achieve their positions of power. As such, they were well acquainted with suspicion and political backstabbing. As Krieg's wealth continuously increased, the autocrats remained under no illusions about their exceptionally luxurious position. They grew increasingly paranoid about any threat that could potentially shatter their dictatorial rule over their hive cities. In such a large galaxy, a bountiful planet such as Krieg would surely attract someone, somewhere, who was waiting for the opportune moment to strike and take all these riches for themselves. Such a threat could come in many shapes and forms, of course, and it wouldn't be the first time that an overly ambitious member of the Council had entertained the possibilities of seizing the Hive cities of his neighbors. In order to enhance their own riches, the Council had been more than capable of cooperation, of course, but they certainly didn't trust one another a single bit. As such, in a continuous arms race, the autocrats recruited larger and larger private armies, with the aim of keeping the balance of power on Krieg in check and, of course, to discourage their ambitious neighbors from attempting an ill-advised coup. But compared to the potential for a civil war on Krieg, an even more devastating possibility that was not overlooked would be an invading force from the outside. 
Far from being strictly loyal to the Imperium, the Autocrats didn't just consider Xenos forces as the only threat the galaxy had to offer. To the leadership of Krieg, it was the wider Imperium itself that was seen as perhaps the greatest threat to their sovereignty. For you see, Krieg was already being subjected to the highest echelons of the available Imperial tithes, and thus the Autocrats had very little love for the Imperium and its taxation policies. But what if Krieg became wealthier still? What guarantee would they have that some bureaucrat back on Terra wouldn't just decide to cut out the middlemen and disband the council entirely? No matter where the threat would eventually come from, it was clear that the autocrats would spare no effort in permanently consolidating their power over Krieg. Their most significant investments were to be the large amounts of orbital defense lasers. Such high-capacity lasers are capable of outright destroying any unauthorized ship in low orbit, by this point, the defense network on the surface alone would have provided sufficient firepower to make any outside force think twice before invading. But for the autocrats, this simply wasn't enough. Just to make sure their rule was guaranteed, they acquired an incredibly large defensive fleet that was permanently stationed in orbit around the planet. By now, the world of Krieg was entirely surrounded by an outward ring of steel that would be nigh impenetrable. The planet of Krieg had become virtually invincible now, and many on the council started to entertain the heretical idea that perhaps separating from the Imperium altogether would be in their best interest. And after all, what could the Imperium realistically hope to do about it? Colonel Yurton was flying in a shuttle back towards his home planet of Krieg. The Astra Militarum had deployed him and his regiment to a minor skirmish with local rebels in the sector. As he entered orbit, he was once again reminded of the defensive flotilla uselessly hanging around the planet. It made him angry just to think how all of these forces were squandered in the pretense of protecting Krieg when they could have been usefully deployed elsewhere, fighting the enemies of the Imperium instead. The Colonel was well known for his reputation of loyalty and vocal support of the Imperium. Because of this, the Council had deliberately kept him on a short leash and under various pretenses deprived him of military leadership over anything more than a minimum amount of troops. Perhaps not all of the autocrats had been corrupted, but Yurton highly suspected the majority on the council, and especially the chairman, harbored traitorous intent. And so, in secret, he had already informed the Ordo Hereticus of his suspicions. During this latest military deployment in the sector, an inquisitor of the Ordo had intercepted the colonel. Yurton and his troops were subjected to long hours of interrogation before the Inquisition was finally convinced sufficiently of the Colonel's unwavering loyalty to the Emperor and the truthfulness of his claims. The autocrats would have to be stopped. Unbeknownst to the traitorous council, the Inquisition had then bolstered Yurton's regiment in size and then sent him back to Krieg. The Inquisition's best bet was that a large detachment, led by an openly loyal officer, would discourage, or at the very least, delay the council's treason. The Inquisition would then have time to covertly deal with these autocrats one by one and bring Krieg under Imperial command before they could rebel in earnest. As such, Colonel Yurton's force slipped unsuspectingly right through the defensive network of Krieg and landed on the planet. General Kraus, the commander-in-chief of the forces on Krieg, after hearing that Colonel Yurton had returned with a suspiciously large force, quickly suspected the inquisitorial plot. He then immediately pressured the council's chairman to deliver the secession speech sooner rather than later. By striking now, they could hopefully prevent Yurton from strengthening the loyalist bulwark on the planet even further. If they striked quickly, perhaps Yurton would not even have time to mount a significant resistance. And so, it was not that long after Colonel Yurton had arrived in Ferrograd that broadcaster speakers throughout all Hive Cities on Krieg aired the chairman's pre-rehearsed message. I have spoken to you often about our relationship with the Imperium of Man. I'm the first to acknowledge that we have enjoyed their protection and free trade with other civilized, prosperous worlds. I know you share my concerns, however, about the price exacted of us in return. Many of us 
Most of you know well the pain of having our sons and daughters torn from us by remote bureaucrats who have never set foot upon our soil or breathed our air. The High Lords of Terra have taken generations of Krieg's children, forcing them to fight, and often die in a war that feel less like our war each day. I weep when I think about what, what those lost generations could have accomplished right here on Krieg. I mourn for the joy they could have brought us, as I do for the world they could have built. So, it is with regret, but also with hope for the future, and after consultation and much discussion with my council, that Krieg declares its secession from Imperial rule. No longer are we prepared to pay punitive tithes, nor tolerate the ever-increasing burden of rules ever imposed upon us. From this moment forth, we are an independent world, sufficient upon ourselves and more than capable of defending ourselves against external threats. All non-Krieg citizens, therefore, must leave this world immediately. This applies to the bureaucratic minions of the Adeptus Administratum. This applies to importers and exporters and to the ambassadors who are no doubt clamoring for an audience with me as I speak. It especially applies to the inquisitorial spies who hoard the shadows around us in the hope of overhearing secrets that can be used against us or detecting thoughts of which they disapprove. I give these people three days to make suitable arrangements after which our borders will be closed. To the rest of you, those born and bred upon this world who take pride in its name and its history, I make this pronouncement. Our long years of vassalage are over. From now on, we shall keep our families close to us and enjoy the fruits of our own labors. From this moment forth, we are finally free. And so, with the delivery of the chairman's speech, Krieg's betrayal and separation from the Imperium was now official. If it was up to Yurton, however, this would not go unpunished. And so he mustered his outnumbered troops for the struggle that was to come. The civil war on Krieg was about to begin. The traitorous plans of Krieg's secession from the Imperium had been long in the making. Over the years, many secret meetings between members of the Council had taken place. Elaborate plans and preparations had been made to ensure the loyalist part of the population would be kept under control as much as possible. Some troublemakers would inevitably rise up at first, but over time Krieg's population would come to accept the new situation. After all, most people would surely be convinced by promises of more lenient working hours and higher wages. But even though they were well prepared, the chairman had still been afraid of the inevitable uncertainty this gamble would bring. Despite the script for the broadcast having been written and finished many months prior, he had long hesitated to make the irreversible declaration of independence official. But now that Colonel Yurton had arrived on the planet, he could no longer delay it. General Kraus, the highest-ranked military commander on Krieg, pressured the chairman to finally take action and to do it quickly. And so, the traitorous speech of the chairman was loudly broadcasted on all speakers across the hive cities of Krieg. People on the streets and in their homes tuned in to the passionate speech of the chairman. But in Hive Ferrograd, Colonel Yurton was no longer listening. Before the speech was even half over, he had already heard enough to know what was going on. And more importantly, he already knew what needed to be done. He ordered a detachment of his troops to secure control over the Astropathica Tower. He needed the Astropath's communications secured in order to send a distress call to the Astra Militarum in order to inform the Imperium of Krieg's betrayal. 
Jurgen himself gathered his personal command squad and made his way to the upper spires of High Ferrograd to meet with the local council members. Without announcing his arrival, he simply barged into the governmental building. Here, a number of Krieg's ruling elite were already present to hold a meeting and discuss the current change of events. Amongst them, two of the most influential leaders of High Ferrograd, High Autocrat Dremond and Autocrat Morel, were present. Yurton's unceremonious arrival had been expected. His role as regimental commander allowed him the privilege of attending the Hive's committee. He couldn't tolerate their usual bureaucratic nonsense, so of course this was not something he would under normal circumstances do. But today he would make an exception. Everyone in the room was fully aware of Yurton's reputation as a dogmatic loyalist, and so his outrage at the chairman's message had been predictable. Unfortunately for these autocrats, the colonel had serious military authority. They were well aware that under the current circumstances, Yurton could potentially order his Astra Militarum regiment to take over the city and even arrest the members of the council if he so pleased. The council would watch their words very closely. Yurton demanded to know if any of them had been aware of the plans for secession. But to his surprise, the autocrats actually admitted that Krieg's independence had indeed been a frequent topic of discussion on the council. However, according to them, they had played no role in the planning of it. And not only that, there had been no formal vote amongst the many different leaders of Krieg either. They strongly emphasized that the secession did not have their approval at all. And they were actually telling the truth. Although they had been well aware of the traitorous meetings, the leaders of Ferrograd had not expected the Declaration of Independence would actually happen. They had known the chairman as a cowardly man, a man of words and empty promises rather than action. They had certainly not expected it to happen without some form of democratic vote amongst the ruling elite first. But then again, they hadn't exactly opposed the chairman either. Jurgen had wished to arrest them right then and there. He could order his men to put them in custody, but without direct proof of their complicity, it would be difficult to get them convicted. Arresting the Hive's leadership at this point in time would cause more problems than it solved. Instead, Jurten demanded that High Autocrat Dremen transmitted a message of their own right away. A broadcast to let the still loyal inhabitants of Krieg know that resistance towards the traitors would start right now at this very moment, and that High Ferrograd would stand with the Imperium no matter what the cost. High Autocrat Dremen tried to weasel his way out of it, he argued that such a broadcast would mean inevitable civil war. He would have no way of knowing if the inhabitants and home god of High Ferrograd would actually stand with the Imperium. They would feel conflicted between High Ferrograd's orders and those of the chairman. And after all, most importantly perhaps, this war could still be avoided if they could somehow convince the chairman to rethink this decision. The other committee members approved this diplomatic approach, but Jurten would have none of it. He told them that if there were to be any sign of insurrection within the Hive, his fully trained and staffed regiment would easily deal with it. As for the chairman, any hesitance to act on their part would be just what the traders would want. Instead, there would be no time to waste, and from now on, Hive Ferrograd would be under strict martial law and make itself ready for war. The autocrats were rightfully afraid that Jurten would try to court-martial them for treason if they protested any further and so they conceded the argument to him. High Autocrat Dremen sighed and left the meeting to make the public announcement that Yurton had demanded. Meanwhile, Yurton had a message of his own to make. He ordered the Astropaths to send a message directly to the chairman himself. It contained only one word. Confess. Meanwhile, over in the capital of Krieg, Hive Oros, civil unrest had now broken out. Part of the population still loyal to the Imperium had been inspired by Ferrograd's resistance. Many people took to the streets themselves in order to protest. Although the chairman ordered his home guard units to break up the protesters, he emphasized he didn't want any civilians harmed or killed. He was still their beloved ruler after all, and he cared for his people. Although some troublemakers perhaps didn't agree with his decision now, he was sure they would all come to understand and accept it sooner or later. If only he could get rid of that troublesome Colonel Yurton. 
Coincidentally, one of the commanders of the chairman's personal guard unit was the colonel's daughter, Sabella Yerton. The chairman had always been fond of her, but with the unrest in the streets it was important to increase his security, and he had to make sure she was still loyal to him. And so, she was ordered to his personal chambers for a conversation. When she had heard the news about the colonel's uprising, she had expected her loyalty would be doubted. She barely even knew her father. For most of her life, he had been away on astromilitarum campaigns, far away from Krieg. But despite her years of loyal service, her name had now condemned her. When brought before the chairman, Sibella Yurton offered to lead a small incursion into Ferrograd. They would infiltrate the hive and start a counter-movement against the colonel to let the people of Ferrograd know that they had not been abandoned by the council. They would use the Yurton name against the colonel by letting it publicly be known his very own daughter stood against him. The chairman liked this idea and was pleased by her loyalty. Undermining the colonel was a solid plan, but it wasn't enough. He preferred to simply get rid of him completely. Instead, he ordered that she take a strike force with her in an attempt to assassinate her father. And so, Sibella Yurton would make her way towards Ferrograd, with a plan to infiltrate the city through the underground tunnel network. Meanwhile, Ferrograd had become the center point of loyalist resistance. From all over Krieg, citizens and guard units flocked towards the Hive. Colonel Yurton's influence and forces had grown significantly. Now he no longer had any use for High Ferrograd's autocrats, and decided this was the opportune time to finally arrest them. To Yurton's dismay, autocrat Morel had managed to avoid captivity by fleeing before his coup, but the others had not been so lucky. Yurton had ordered them guilty of treason. They had plotted against the Emperor of Mankind and were sentenced to death. He ordered to have them publicly executed to send a message to all traitors on Krieg. They would be put before a firing squad. On Yurton's personal orders, the guardsmen raised their bolt pistols and then fired. With the autocrats of High Ferrograd dead, the city was now officially under the complete control of Colonel Yurton. Deep in the Underhive's dark tunnels, Autocrat Morel was hiding. She had made her break just hours before the inevitable coup and had used her influential relations to make herself disappear. She had almost made it out of the city to safety, but not everything had gone according to plan. In the Underhive, her prestigious family name meant nothing, and she had been betrayed and robbed. Now, she was stuck in these dark sewers, not knowing where to go. She had been here for days now, until suddenly she heard lots of footsteps coming down the pipes. She thought it was soldiers who had come looking for her, so she made a run for it. But she was too late, and a fatal las gun shot hit her in the back. But it turned out they hadn't come for her specifically. Instead, it had been a clean-up squad hunting down and exterminating the growing population of mutants occupying Ferrograd's underhive. They hadn't been able to tell the former autocrat apart from the subhumans living down here in the filth. It was one of these cleanup squads who would eventually run into Sabella Yurton. She and her strike force had finally made her way underneath the walls of Ferrograd. After a tense exchange in the dark tunnels, she identified herself to be the daughter of Colonel Yurton and asked to see her father. She had no intention of killing her father, but instead joined the resistance. When news of this reached Hive Oros, the chairman was furious. He should have listened to General Kraus and not have trusted her. But it was too late now. Too much time had been wasted and his only hope of getting rid of Colonel Yurton quietly had been ruined. He would send no more offers for negotiations. It was all pointless anyway as Yurton had not bothered responding to a single one of them. As far as the chairman was concerned, the time for diplomacy was over. He ordered General Kraus to start his offensive using all the means necessary to bring Ferrograd to heal. Soon airplanes lifted off from High Voros. The first military action of the Civil War was to run a bombing raid over High Ferrograd. Meanwhile, the ground armies from the surrounding Hive cities made their way towards the city as well in order to completely surround and besiege it. While Colonel Yurton was preparing for the onslaught, his earlier astropathic distress call to the Astro Militarum was finally answered. He was ordered to hold out as long as they could in the name of the Emperor. But for now, no reinforcements were available that could break through Krieg's orbital defenses. Yurton wasn't at all surprised. 
Asking for reinforcements had been a long shot, but he had to try. Even if no help was coming, at least the Imperium would know what was happening on the surface of Krieg. With the chairman's forces on their way to surround the city, the first bombs were already falling on Ferrograd. And they would not stop until Yurton surrendered. The civil war on Krieg was now well underway. The chairman's army had besieged High Ferrograd for 18 months now. An elaborate trench network completely surrounded the city. On a daily basis, the air raid sirens wailed loudly whenever bomber airplanes arrived to drop their payloads onto the spires of the city. Day in and day out, the ground trembled as the chairman's forces fired their long-range artillery on the city. Although over time this would certainly inflict considerable damage, its rockcrete walls and buildings were strong and withstood the shelling fairly well. Hive cities run deep underground, with many layers stacked on top of one another. Even if they managed to pulverize the outer layers, it would still take considerable firepower to achieve any real damage to a hive's infrastructure. The living and breathing heart of its population would simply continue to live and function in the underhive beneath the rubble. Clearly it would take more than a mere handful of bombs to bring a large hive city like Ferrograd to heal. The defenders didn't just hide idly behind their walls either. Anti-air defenses fired clouds of flak at the incoming aircraft, causing Krieg's air force to take heavy losses. Almost half of the airplanes that flew over Ferrograd were shot down, and whenever artillery shells started raining down upon the city, the defenders' cannons would respond in kind with counter-battery fire to shut down the attackers' guns. Although they were outnumbered and outgunned, the soldiers of Ferrograd made sure that this war would not just be a one-sided affair. After all, the troops Colonel Yurton had brought back to Krieg were a well-trained and well-disciplined regiment of the Astra Militarum, and they were more than a match for the planet's militia forces. Even though the siege of Ferrograd had raged on for more than a year already, due to the defenders' competent resistance, the chairman had little to show for it. Even the general population had gotten used to the war by now, and apart from the daily air raid siren and the occasional spire crumbling down, life for most citizens in the city continued as normal. They woke up, went to work, hid in an air raid shelter, went back to work, then went to bed only for it to all repeat exactly the same the next day. But Ferrograd would not be able to sustain this war of attrition forever. Despite its valiant defensive efforts, it was still only one hive city against many. Eventually, Yurton's forces would run out of the necessary resources to continue their resistance. To even the odds, Yurton had sent out nightly stealth teams into the enemy trenches to sabotage their equipment. For a long time, this tactic had proven successful, taking out enemy tanks and artillery pieces, but recently it had stopped being effective as the attackers had learned to counteract these raids. Krieg's war would be lost by the first side to exhaust its resources. Every citizen of Ferrograd would have to pull their weight. But they had two advantages. First, they were fighting for a just cause they truly believed in, against traitors who fought for nothing. Second, they had been joined by a prestigious member of the cult Mechanicus, Arc Magos Greel. In this war of attrition, Greel's many Mechanicus acolytes turned out to be invaluable in repairing weapons, vehicles, and even turning scrap into useful resources. Greel had drawn up plans to modify the existing lasgun rifles that Yurton's forces had been using. They would be easier to manufacture as they required less complex parts to produce, and they would even pack more of a punch per shot, although this was counterbalanced by a slower firing rate. He had turned the Underhive into an industrial complex of wearing machines constantly producing food and war material. 
He had even started a program to genetically modify and breed horses for Ferrograd's cavalry companies. Although this might not seem particularly useful as long as they were trapped inside these walls, it might prove useful later was the rationale. And after all, the Archimagos was planning much further ahead than most. It was him who had earlier ordered the sweeping of the Underhive's pipes, the place where Autocrat Morale had been killed, in order to clear the area of mutants and put it to better use. But even Greel did not see a way out of their current predicament, with the way things were going now. However, he had one trick up the sleeves of his long red Mechanicus robes. He had records of Mechanicus data slates in his possession that recorded the existence of ancient Terran weaponry from the Dark Age of Technology. It was stored somewhere deep in the underhives of Ferrograd. Without consulting Colonel Yurton, he had already started digging and exploring in the ancient vaults and locked crypts deep under the hive. If he was able to find them, and should they still prove functional, perhaps this could turn the tide of the war. All he would have to do is convince Yurton to use these weapons. Yurton's daughter also proved a valuable asset. She had spent most of her life in the chairman's direct service and knew a lot about the autocrats. She even had a few loyalist contacts back in Hive Oros who would relay information to her. It was rumored that the chairman had fallen ill since he had not given a public speech in months. Sabella Yurton offered her father to be sent out on a mission to assassinate the chairman. She had been able to sneak into Ferrograd using the underground tunnels. She could do the same in reverse and sneak into Hive Oros. If the chairman was sick, he would be recovering in his personal bedchambers. Having once served as his private bodyguard, she would be able to sneak into the palace. She would know exactly where to find him and kill him. Command of the army would surely fall into the hands of General Kraus, but this was practically the case anyway. The chairman's death would send a message to the rest of Krieg's autocrats that the Emperor's justice would come. Even in their own hive cities, they would not be safe. Yurton approved of the plan, and so Sibella Yurton assembled her specialized strike team and through the underground tunnels made her way back to Hive Oros. The chairman had no idea of what was about to take place. The strike force sneaked into his chambers wearing gas masks. They then deployed a poisonous gas and shot the bodyguards. One of his servants warned the chairman of the infiltration. Perhaps he could still have escaped because there was a secret passageway behind his wardrobe that even Sabella Yurton did not know about. But the chairman was sick, and it took him too long to get out of bed. The poisonous gas entered his bedroom, and then his lungs. His servant made it out just in time before the strike force entered the room, shutting the secret wardrobe door behind him. Shooting the chairman at this point was no longer necessary. The poisonous gas was doing its work, suffocating him as he lay on the floor. It burned away his eyes and skin, and he slowly and painfully died right then and there. The last thing he saw before he lost his vision was the image of gas mask wearing soldiers standing over him. But when General Kraus was informed of the infiltration attack, he had a suspicion who might be behind this daring raid. And so, he had laid a trap in the passageway that he suspected Sibella Yurton and her strike force would take to get out of the city. He had been right. And in their attempted escape out of Hive Oros, they walked straight into his ambush and they were all killed. Yurton was informed of his daughter's death, but had no time to mourn or even think about it. Back on High Ferrograd, the attackers had broken through the northern wall of the city. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat broke out in the rubble of the outskirts. The colonel and his command squad were in the middle of the fray, swinging chainswords and killing traitors with their own hands. The militia forces were no match for the veteran guardsmen and fled. Yurton pursued the enemy but realized he had been lured into a trap. Before he could retreat, volleys of Lasgun shots already pinned down his squad. He himself was shot in the leg and chest. His bodyguards dragged the wounded colonel away from the fighting to safety. He would never walk again without support, but for now he was alive. Until the Mechanicus servants could craft an artificial hip for him, his second-in-command, Lieutenant Jonas, would take over command of the front lines. Eventually, they managed to drive the attackers out of the city. But the breach of their walls was yet another sign that the defense of Ferrograd was steadily crumbling. 
Greel used this moment of weakness to inform Yurton and his command squad of the legendary weapons hidden below Ferrograd. He had in fact already found and entered these vaults himself. Although the schematics of these ancient and forbidden weapons had been lost, their powerful effects were understood. Should they be used, they would surely destroy their enemies, but millions of innocent citizens would be vaporized in the blast waves. In the worst case scenario, they could even potentially turn the entirety of Krieg into an ashen wasteland for centuries to come. But at the very least, the planet would not fall into traitorous hands. Archmagos Greel had done all he could, and the next decision would be up to Colonel Yurton. Then came the day of the Emperor's Ascension, a common festival in the name of the Emperor of Mankind, celebrating the moment when 10,000 years ago the Emperor was raised to the Golden Throne and became a divinity. General Kraus had sent a few extra squadrons of bombers over Ferrograd to mock the Loyalists. While they were celebrating, they could hear the rumble even down below in the Underhive. After several years of siege warfare, two-thirds of Ferrograd had been turned into rubble. More and more, the defenders were being forced to hold out underground. He was tired of having to endure General Kraus's denigrating demands for surrender. He was tired of hiding from the enemy bombardments. Especially on this most holy of days, no insult towards the Emperor and his followers should go unpunished. But there was little he could do. He had tried to defend his home planet against these traitors, but he realized he was losing. Deep in his heart, Krieg no longer felt like home. And perhaps most importantly, at the back of his mind, nagged the loss of his daughter. It was then, with a heavy heart, that Yurton made his decision. The weapons will be launched. He ordered Greel to prepare the missiles, and together with his command squad made his way to the launch silos. But his officers protested the use of these weapons. Krieg would be devastated, innocent people would be killed. Yurton tried to explain to them that this was the only way and his decision was final. They mutinied and threatened to arrest the colonel. He had predicted this, however. In secret, he had already ordered snipers to cover the launch silo and on his order, shots rang out, firing at the officers who fell dead, right where they had tried to detain the colonel. His second-in-command, Lieutenant Jonas, was still alive on the ground. Yurton drew his last pistol and shot him in the head. All remaining doors, windows, panels, and ventilation shafts in High Ferrograd were ordered shut and sealed. Then out of the rubble of Ferrograd, large missiles slowly raised high into the sky in salvos of three. More than 20 of them spread out over the planet. Two of them made their way directly to Hive Oros. It is done, the colonel said. He felt relieved. The first missiles rained down on Hive Oros, and the city blazed in a flash of light brighter than the sun. Anyone who had looked into the flash had their optic nerves burned and was immediately and permanently turned blind. A huge fireball engulfed the hive and rose up into the skies. The blast wave then followed, and the upper levels of the hive erupted into a cloud of smoke and rubble. They had no warning or time to prepare, so large amounts of radioactivity and toxic dust was blasted down into the lower levels and seeped into the underhive. The army encircling Ferrograd stood in disbelief. Those who had not already had their retinas burned off could not believe what they were now seeing. They had already assumed victory over the Loyalists. It would have taken another year or so, but the resistance in Farograd would have eventually been beaten. These assumptions shattered before their very eyes. What they were witnessing now was beyond belief, but there it was. Far in the distance where Hive Oro stood, a growing mushroom cloud rose towards the heavens. Then the other missiles started arriving at their destinations. Hive Wolfram and Hive Agentes were next. Some of the missiles even detonated high into the skies and set the planet's atmosphere ablaze. Shockwaves rippled through the defensive rings of ships in orbit around Grieg. Many of the vessels were caught in the blasts and started to crash down towards the surface. None of the hive cities on Grieg would be spared, for they had all followed the chairman's orders and marched on Ferrograd. As the skies turned dark and it started to rain acid, Kraus and his army were caught in the open. Recovering from their disbelief, the soldiers quickly began to search for cover. Strong winds swept the plains, and even several hurricanes started forming. 
In the face of this apocalypse, many of these traitors, now realizing the irony, started praying to the Emperor. General Krauss was unable to cope with this new reality, and committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. Hurriedly, the troops scattered in all directions in hopes of surviving, not realizing almost all of them would die from radiation poisoning within a few days. As the decaying skin fell off their bones and their organs gave out, they would regret the days they had betrayed the Emperor of Mankind. After a week, the firestorms calmed down. The first person to step out of High Ferrograd's protective rockery bunkers was Colonel Yurton. He wore a long, heavy reinforced trench coat and a gas mask with a long hose connected to a respirator box on his chest. Even with the protection, going out there was dangerous, but he had to see the devastation for himself. In the far distance, he could see a few remaining molten and crooked spires of Hyvoros and Agentes. Deep in the rubbles of these hives, traitors remained, but the tables had turned. Soon it would be Colonel Yurton who would lay siege to them, and then Krieg's purge would finally be complete. Over the many years to come, the inhabitants of Krieg would fight their civil war to the bitter end. The toxic ashen wastelands made existence extremely difficult, but through the sheer will of Yurton and the ingenuity of Archimagos Greel, the forces of Ferrograd would besiege and purge the remaining hive cities. Because the surface was too inhospitable, much of the fighting took place in the darkness of deep underground tunnels. But clad in greatcoats and gas masks, the Death Corps even faced the harsh conditions above ground when necessary. Due to Greel's breeding program, the horses of Krieg had turned into formidable mounts that proved more than useful when traversing the devastated terrain of Krieg to chase down the traitors and mutants. But while they were busy carving out their new world from the ashes, the human population of Krieg was dwindling. Even amongst the loyalists, the birth rates were plummeting. Soon there would be no one left to inhabit the planet. Yurton was now old and Greel visited his deathbed. He had long tried to convince the Colonel to consider the Vita Womb technology that the Mechanicus possessed. To apply this technology to humans was prohibited, maybe heretical even. By firing those ancient forbidden weapons long ago, Yurton had already had enough on his conscience. He passed away that night into the Emperor's blessing. But regardless of whether the Colonel had given his approval or not, Greel would continue his plans. He had the Mechanicus install the birthing installations deep within Ferrograd's Underhive, far away from the sight of any curious eyes. Should any of Ferrograd's new leadership protest, the Archmagos would simply claim he had Yurton's blessing, and that would be the end of it. But everyone understood what was required to save Krieg, and so no one objected. Five hundred years later, the Civil War was finally over. And when ships of the Imperium arrived at Krieg, the planet appeared completely dead. The toxic atmosphere did not seem capable of sustaining any form of life. What had happened on Krieg had almost been forgotten. It was reduced to merely a note in the Imperial archives. To their surprise, however, a single transport lifted off from the dead planet's surface to approach the ship. When it boarded, the Imperial delegation was met by six soldiers wearing gas masks and long dark trench coats. The soldier highest in rank was merely a colonel. They introduced themselves as the Death Corps of Krieg, willing to serve once more in the Emperor's name, ready to be immediately sent to the most hazardous war zones with a fully equipped 20 regiments. The delegation was stunned and wondered how a Death World could support such a large army. When asked how numerous the civilian population of Krieg was, the colonel replied with only one sentence. There are no civilians on Krieg, only soldiers. Yeah.